Joining me now, Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton. How you doing, Tom? How's everything? Hey, Don. I'm doing very well. It's good to be on with you. Good to see you, man. Uh, crazy times. Uh, it's. Have you seen in, in your political career uh, perhaps the press act as dishonestly as they are right now with their sort of, you know, the artificial boosting of Kamala Harris? W will she ever have to answer for her support of defunding the police, open borders, giving Medicare to illegal immigrants, or are they just going to let her hide in a basement like they did Joe Biden in 2020? Well, Don, I mean, given how dishonest uh, and liberal the press has always been, but especially since your dad first came down the escalator nine years ago, it's hard to pick a single moment in which they've done the worst, but it, it may be the last three weeks, I have to agree. Um, I mean, the press is acting like a force field around Kamala Harris or a phalanx of bodyguards. Um, again, the, what we know about her and how she's a San Francisco liberal is not from, you know, anonymous leaks or white papers that got leaked to the media. It's things that she said in her own voice on camera just five years ago when she was running for president in her own right. And they're pretending like it never happened. And even though they are the press, the media, their job is to ask questions and to demand that leaders speak to them and answer those questions for the American people. We're now going on three weeks in which Kamala Harris has barely a answered a single question at all. I guess they think in the high command of her campaign, if they can just get her through 12 more weeks without answering your questions, maybe she can win. Because we all know the kind of incomprehensible word salads for which she's become rightly famous. Or the other scenario when she opens her mouth in an unscripted fashion is she just reminds everyone of what a dangerous San Francisco liberal she is. But there you have today the press out putting out there a glossy magazine cover of her on Time magazine about the reintroduction of Kamala Harris, which is, I don't know, like the seventh or eighth reintroduction of her, because she always wants to say whatever she thinks at the moment will get her elected unless unless she's speaking to what she knows to be a friendly audience, like the Democratic electorate in 2019, yeah. and then the mask slips and she reveals herself, as always, to be a dangerous San Francisco liberal. Well, I mean, just today, Karine Jean-Pierre, the White House press secretary, said from the White House podium that there is no, quote unquote, daylight between Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Doesn't that kill Kamala's campaign? I mean, she seems to be going against all of the policies that literally her administration was part of, the things that created the economic disaster that we're seeing that encouraged, as far as I'm concerned, all these wars abroad. Why would anyone want four more years of this mess if there's no daylight between the campaigns? Yeah, I, I totally agree, Don. There is no daylight between Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Um, from the very beginning, they insisted that it's the Biden-Harris administration. And what do you think is a better guide for what Kamala Harris to do as president? What she is now having anonymous aides say on background while she dodges the media or what she said in her own voice when she ran in 2019 and what she's done as Joe Biden's wingman. Remember, the reason we have inflation is the Democrats passed two trillion dollar tax and spend bills. She literally cast the deciding vote for those bills both times in the U.S. Senate. The reason we have war in Europe and war in the Middle East is Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have projected weakness from the very beginning. Look at the disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan, which emboldened Vladimir Putin. She says, I was there in the room. I was the last person egging on Joe Biden to do it. Same thing in the Middle East. Benjamin Netanyahu comes to the United States a couple of weeks ago. She refuses as president of the Senate in her constitutional duty to preside over the joint session. She has a meeting with him in private. Then she upbraids Israel for civilian casualties in Gaza, which is solely the responsibility of Hamas. And what happens two days later? She has emboldened Iranian-backed terrorists in Hezbollah to blow up Israeli kids playing ball on a playground. This isn't what you had when your dad was president. We had peaceful, stable relationships in the Middle East and around the world because our enemies knew that they should never take a shot at America or at our friends. Well, you know, Senator Cotton, you served honorably in the U.S. Army, uh, and you wrote the other day, uh, you know, talking about her VP choice, Tim Waltz's unit got orders to Iraq. They got ordered to Iraq. He could have gone with them, but he didn't. He let his troops go to war without him instead. Can you talk a little bit about what you think about Tim Waltz leaving before his troops got deployed? I mean, when it, when it first started, it was a stolen valor thing. I thought it was bad, but every day it gets worse. Like he, 
he, he, you know, he lies about his rank and he goes back to his weapons of war. And there's every day it's like, you know, but this guy was Rambo in his own mind and what he told his constituency. And yet uh, that's clearly not the case. It seems like he was just a coward. Well, Don, I thought J.D. Vance put it well yesterday on Sunday shows when he said this isn't about Tim Waltz's service, which we respect and honor the service of all veterans. This is about Tim Waltz and now the campaign's multiple inconsistent and inaccurate statements about that service. Um, as you said, at first, I was simply putting two and two together of that things that were not explicit. But now it's clear, again, from the command sergeant major you showed earlier, the chaplain, the battalion commander in his unit, multiple public records that Tim Waltz misrepresented his service uh, about the rank at which he retired or about his service in Afghanistan versus Europe, or about when he knew that his unit was going to be deploying to Iraq and when he submitted his retirement papers. I think the American people deserve answers from Tim Waltz uh, about these statements characterizing his military service. But Tim Waltz is apparently thinks that, that he can skate by without answering any questions, just like Kamala Harris does. And, and you know, for that matter, while we're on the questions that Tim Waltz should be answering, he needs to answer for his very strange and long-standing relationship with the Chinese Communist Party. Yeah, talk, there, talk about that a little bit, because I mean, it, it seems like this guy, this guy's links to the CCP uh, make Joe Biden's actually look kind of minor by any other standard. And frankly, those were ridiculous already, considering the circumstances. Yeah, so, Don, it goes back 35 years. I, I think Tim Waltz has taken around 30 trips to China. Almost all of those have been sponsored and funded in part or in whole by the Chinese government, which is to say the Chinese Communist Party. He was doing that as a young teacher. In some cases, he was taking students there, no doubt to be exposed to communist propaganda and indoctrinated. Uh, he apparently honeymooned in China and even got married on the anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989. In Congress, he had a consistently soft record on China as well, downplaying the threat that China posed to this country. Uh, and I could just tell you, as a member of the Intelligence Committee who has studied the Chinese Communists and their practices and trying to infiltrate American society and American government, this is a classic example of long-term cultivation that the Chinese Communists do. They start early. They start with young politicians or young civic leaders and teachers. They cultivate them over years or decades at a minimum to generate sympathetic voices in American society who might be advocating on behalf of the Chinese to their local congressman or their senator. But when their chip really comes in, those people might become, like say Eric Swalwell, a congressman, or Tim Waltz, a congressman and a governor and now a vice presidential nominee. So because this is such a common pattern in practice, by the Chinese Communist Party to cultivate American leaders for the long term. Tim Waltz really owes the American people answers for this relationship that he had going back decades, financially backed by the Chinese Communist Party. For that matter, Kamala Harris owes the American people answers as well in this question. Yeah, I mean, did they even vet him or do they just not care? Because it seems like those connections, you know, are are sort of obvious. It, it took, you know, guys like me, you know, about two minutes to figure that this is a connection that would probably you know, set up a lot of red flags for the American public. And yet it doesn't seem to matter for Democrats. Are they just are, are they just all in on it at this point? Do they even care? Well, well, Donna, I think on most of these things, it, it's simply a blind spot for liberals in the Democratic Party like Kamala Harris and the people she had vetting these nominees. I mean, Tim Waltz served in the military. What else can you say about that? They don't dig in deep to his actual statements as a politician about his service record. Uh, they think it's a great thing to be going on so-called cultural exchanges or sensitivity and uh, understanding tours of China with, in many cases, their fellow communists. Or consider his policy record. You know, he signed a law that said there have to be tampons in boys' bathrooms at, as low as fourth grade, or that he's going to make abortion available on demand up to the ninth month of pregnancy in Minnesota. Look at his tax and spend record in Minnesota. To the Democrats, these are not bugs. These are features. These are things that probably recommended him to Kamala Harris. He wants to make Minnesota like California. Yeah. It, it's hard to believe. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here. I'm talking with the United States senator. I, I literally can't even believe we're having this conversation, right? It's uh, uh, it, it should be scary. But, I, I, you know, obviously, I know it's something you care a lot about. But, you know, how, you know, talk in further detail how the CCP has done 
those things, how they how they do try to latch on to those young you know, Americans. I mean, I, I think you can see it in, in a lot of things. There's clearly uh, they're running a lot of not just the fentanyl issue that they're clearly doing nothing about and probably encouraging. Uh, but it seems like they run a lot of sort of psyops into the United States, you know, through media, through their funding of various programs. What are the other things Americans have to understand about what the Chinese Communist Party is actually doing in America to manipulate things into their favor? Yeah, Don, for decades, the Chinese communists have tried to infiltrate American society and government and influence American opinion about China. You had a couple examples there. I can give you a few more. Look at the so-called Confucius Institutes at college campuses, which your dad cracked down on when he was in office. Again, nothing more than influence operations using college students, college professors to try to cultivate pro-Chinese communist sentiments in America. Consider Hollywood. When was the last time you saw a Hollywood movie with a Chinese villain? I bet you can't name it because it's yeah, been- they won't let you go into China if you have it, so- exactly. uh... And this, this goes back to the mid-1990s, for instance, with Seven Years in Tibet and Brad King, um, and the blowback that the movie studios got from that and that the actors in that movie got. And ever since then, China didn't have to object to Hollywood studios making movies with Chinese villains or that portrayed the Tibetans, for instance, in a friendly light, because every movie studio and every A-list actor knew not to make such movies, not to star in such movies. Consider what happened with Daryl Morey, the general manager of the Houston Rockets. He merely reposted a image on social media in favor of Hong Kongers autonomy and freedom as the Chinese communists promised to give them when they took back uh, control of that territory in 1997. And what happened? China came down like a ton of bricks on the NBA and the Houston Rockets. They cut off access to their games in China, which is one of their biggest overseas markets. Surprise, surprise, within just a few weeks, Daryl Morey was out of a job. You had the owner of the Brooklyn Nets, uh, who is a Chinese communist sympathizer, objecting that that should have never happened. Steve Kerr and LeBron James, who benefit greatly from their financial ties with China, saying that, well, there's free speech, but you have to be responsible with your speech, especially if it hits you in your pocketbook, I guess. Um, again, and Chinese communists are cultivating at every level local leaders, too, to become Chinese communist mouthpieces and maybe ultimately leaders. This has happened in Arkansas, I can tell you, is that politicians who are in one way or the other trying to win favor with China, trying to recruit uh, investment into Arkansas that want me or other uh, of our elected leaders in Congress to go soft on China. Now, that stopped a long time ago with me because I think they knew that they were barking up the wrong tree. After all, I got sanctioned by China years ago. But it happens in every one of our states try to influence our politics. Crazy. I mean, you know, I guess under the Harris Biden, we've also seen a record for the most embassy evacuations of any administration in our history. Um, what what message does that send to the rest of the world? I think you believe, obviously, uh, with us that you know a strong America is good for the rest of the world. But that feels like we're just exuding weakness. What do you see there, Senator? Yeah, I, I mean, for three plus years now, thanks to Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Uncle Sam has had a kick me sign on our back. Um, you know, it started most notoriously with the failed evacuation out of Afghanistan, which would have never happened under President Trump. You have all these embassy closures um, and a refusal to stand up for Americans. Uh, I mean, just consider that last week there were a couple more attacks on our yeah. troops in Iraq, and there's been no response. There has been dozens and dozens of such attacks around the world on american forces and you can probably count the number of responses on a single hand maybe both hands again that wasn't the case with donald trump you saw for four years what happened when america has strength and confidence when we stand alongside our allies and we're willing to apply the discriminant use of military force president trump had to bomb syria twice he had to kill qasem Soleimani in iran but what did you get after that you didn't get another forever war. You didn't get an invasion of a country and trying to occupy it and turning it into a Western democracy like the Netherlands or Denmark. You got peace and stability because people like the Ayatollahs in Iran got the picture that America would defend our interests and our people. With Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, they think they can get away literally with murder. So I guess with that, with, with respect to sort of our biggest adversaries, whether it's China or Iran, what are the differences in policy and approach between Trump and the Harris-Biden administration? And what's, and specifically, uh, as it relates to, say, Taiwan uh, and the so-called reunification? 
Well, with Iran, uh, I mean, I think that's the simplest example since uh, both of them face the same set of, of leaders and similar circumstances. Again, President Trump, after a series of attack on, on Americans in 2019, struck back. He killed Qasem Soleimani, Iran's terrorist mastermind. What did Iran do? They pulled in their horns. By the end of his uh, uh, term in office, there was some threats. I saw those threats coming through the intelligence reporting that they were maybe going to strike Americans again. What did he do? You probably recall this. He tweeted out some friendly health advice to the Ayatollahs <laughs> that if a single hair on an American head was harmed, then they were going to have hell to pay. It didn't happen. What happens with Joe Biden and Kamala Harris? All they can ever say, for instance, is don't. They keep yeah. telling Vladimir Putin and the Ayatollahs and Hamas and Hezbollah don't. And what do they do? They keep doing it. They keep harming Americans. They keep targeting our friends in places like Israel. Now, on China, what you've seen is Joe Biden trying not to reverse in name Donald Trump's policies because he knows that those are popular across a broad bipartisan spectrum of Americans. But in practice, they've done everything they can to reverse those policies, not enforcing sanctions seriously, not updating those sanctions, not cracking down on nations that are transshipping Chinese steel or solar panels or other products that are being dumped in America and killing American jobs. And most notably, again, with Taiwan. I mean, four times Joe Biden has said we would defend Taiwan if China attacked it, only to have it walked back by anonymous White House aides within a few hours. Kamala Harris has said nothing, even though she says she wants to be commander in chief in less than six months. President Trump made it clear from the very beginning that people like Xi Jinping and the Ayatollahs and Kim Jong-un should not take any kind of aggressive action. And what did we get again? We didn't have war. We had peace and stability around the world. So I guess another point you mentioned Israel in that, you know, when pro-Hamas demonstrators interrupted Kamala, she had to speak from a script and really appease them. Uh, what does that say to anyone watching right now uh, exactly what her policies are going to be. Again, I think we understand that, you know, she'll say and do anything it can to get elected, but um, that's sort of scary stuff, especially given the insanity of what we've seen there. Well, I'm glad you noticed that, Don. Uh, I'd point out two different contrasts. The first time she got interrupted last week by pro-Hamas radicals, she didn't have a script, and she shot them the evil eye, and she said that they had had their time to speak, and if they wanted to keep speaking, they were only helping Donald Trump get elected. Otherwise, yeah. she was going to speak. And all the other Democrats there applauded and clapped. Note what she didn't say. She didn't say, you are demented and crazy to be backing Hamas, which committed the worst atrocity against Jews since World War II. Yeah. She said that you talking is going to help elect Donald Trump. Yeah. In effect, agreeing with them. Then a couple of days later, I guess the high command of her campaign had said, you know, that's too provocative. That's too aggressive towards an important element of our party the pro-Hamas anti-Semitic wing of our party, whose votes we need. So they literally, as you pointed out, had a script for her written, sitting on a piece of paper on her podium. So when she was interrupted from giving her planned speech on a teleprompter, she could look down and start reading it. And yeah. what did she say? Again, she didn't say, what is wrong with you people? You're supporting a bloodthirsty terrorist group that has the blood of Americans on its hands. It's still literally today holding American citizens hostage. She says, I hear your voice. Your voice is important. We need a ceasefire now, which is, in effect, given conditions in Gaza, the pro-Hamas position. I can tell you that if you think Joe Biden has been weak over these last three and a half years, Kamala Harris would be much weaker and more dangerous as the commander in chief. Well, I mean, it seems to me to be pretty clear that, you know, she didn't go with Shapiro of Pennsylvania uh, simply because he's Jewish. And that would just ostracize sort of the Hamas wing of her party and or voter base. But um that should be scary, to, I think, to a lot of Americans. Yeah, it should be. Uh, anybody that cares about Israel, anybody that cares about the strength and the safety of America and Americans around the world. Um, look, by the end of this campaign or by the end of the vetting process, uh, it was clear that Josh Shapiro and Tim Waltz and Mark Kelly did not really have much difference on their views about Israel. Yeah. But you had those pro-Hamas elements in their party who had run a targeted campaign of dumping opposition research on Josh Shapiro about articles he'd written in college in defense of Israel or condemning Yasser Arafat's terrorism or his you know, study abroad program in Israel. The only real difference between Josh Shapiro and Tim Waltz is that Josh Shapiro is an observant Jew who is raising his family and his kids 
to be observant and sending them to Jewish day schools. Of course, there is a, one other big difference. Which is John Shapiro is the popular governor of probably the most important swing state. Yet what did Kamala Harris do? Go with the other guy. Because she, I won't say that she caved in to the radical left of her party because she belongs to the radical left. I'll simply say that she catered to them. Yeah, I get, yeah, I think that's right. What, what do you think, what's the next country, Senator Cotton, or or part of the world uh, that we should be keeping our eye on as a possible hot zones? Uh, you know, are there other are growing conflicts that are happening sort of under the radar that we should be prepared for because it, it's not clear who's actually at the helm of, you know, uh, America right now? Well, I do think the most immediate risk of a broader war is in the Middle East. I, I mean, as far as we know, Iran and Hezbollah could be getting ready to strike Israel tonight because, again, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have said now for two weeks um, after Israel concluded what was a very, very successful, almost miraculous effort at targeting terrorist leaders throughout the region um, that Iran should not do this, but also Israel should tone it down. They're escalating things. They're being too provocative. That's not what President Trump would have said. He would have said what he did repeatedly, which is he stands with Israel, and if Iran strikes Israel, we'll strike back with Israel three times as hard. And again, what did you have? Peace and stability. Now, beyond that immediate threat, of course, the most dangerous and hottest potential flashpoint in the world is in the Western Pacific with Taiwan, which as Douglas MacArthur said, it would be a, a disaster of the utmost significance if that island ever fell into the hands of a power hostile to the United States. I do think, though, we shouldn't um, neglect our southern border and the threat we mm -hmm. face there, a threat from drug cartels who are running fentanyl in the country and gang members, and also the number of foreign terrorists that are simply coming into Mexico and walking ali ali oxen free across our border. Our border was secure, just like the world was stable and peaceful under President Trump. It is an extremely dangerous place right now because of Joe Biden and his borders are Kamala Harris. Uh, Senator Cotton, for those who don't know, talk a little bit about uh, just Taiwan, because, you know, people are like, oh, well, you know, it's just an island off. I mean, w whether it's semiconductors, microchips, you know, everything else that's there, if China got a control of that, uh, what risk does it pose the, to the United States that, you know, because it seems like that would be really significant. It's greatly overlooked. And I imagine, you know, China's probably always had a timeline for when they wanted to go do that. But I think watching this administration and you know, a future Harris administration has rapidly accelerated whatever their timeline was for trying to take back Taiwan. Sure, Don. Um, I get this question some in Arkansas as well. Well, it's a small island. It's so far away. It's right next to China. Is it really that big of a deal? You know, the world didn't collapse when uh, Chinese communists rolled into Hong Kong and suppressed the Hong Kongers freedom and autonomy. It's bad, but, you know, we're not in the middle of World War III. Um, Taiwan is simply different. Uh, most immediately, as you point out, Taiwan produces the world's most advanced microchips and in volume produces some of the world, some of the largest volumes of microchips. And if you tried to buy a pickup truck two or three years ago, you remember the long delays you had in part because of supply chain challenges with semiconductors. If China went for the jugular in Taiwan, no matter what happened, you would have an immediate global recession, maybe a global depression, because at a minimum, those factories would be pulled offline for probably months likely they'd be destroyed and China doesn't have the ability to reconstitute them. But maybe worst of all, if China succeeded and occupied Taiwan and those factories were still producing those microchips, then they could hold it over the United States and essentially blackmail us the way they have tried to do with other countries and other goods, the way they threatened to do with medical supplies and medicines during the coronavirus. Um, second, Taiwan's geography makes it unique. Um, to go back to Douglas MacArthur again, at the outset of the Korean War, he called it the unsinkable aircraft carrier and submarine tender because it is strategically located between Japan and the Philippines, two American treaty allies, because it's what uh, another admiral called the cork in the bottle of the South China Sea, through which almost half of global trade flows. Control of that island by China would allow it to threaten American prosperity and safety and our allies in a way that it simply cannot do while Taiwan is not under Chinese communist control. What President Trump did, which is what other presidents had done since we switched our diplomatic recognition to mainland China in the 1970s, is maintain the peaceful status quo. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have threatened that and they will continue to threaten it if she wins this November. So it's really hard to overstate just how important Taiwan is 
to America's security and to America's prosperity and how ill-equipped Kamala Harris is to protect that. So a breaking story tonight from Real Clear Politics at a Secret Service special agent partially responsible for developing the plan to secure the rally where my father was nearly assassinated is now under internal agency investigation for, quote, posting videos and photos from her protective assignments to social media, according to several sources within the Secret Service community. I mean, Senator Cotton, where do we go from here? It feels like, you know, again, maybe I take this one a little bit more personally than most because it's my father, but, uh, <laughs> man, it's... It's almost impossible to not uh, to talk about the insanity of everything we've seen. And, you know, then also how quickly that disappeared from the news. What are your thoughts on all of this? Yeah, uh, well, you should take it personally because it's your father. And, and, you know, we've talked about this before. I want to join what you've said and what your dad has said and recognizing the bravery and the skill of those officers who were around him in Butler who have been protecting uh, your family as well yeah. over the years. They deserve much better leadership within the Secret Service. I think that's very clear at this point. Um, one of the first things that President Trump should do once he takes office again is to look for a, a new dynamic outside leader uh, who can come into the Secret Service and provide it with the leadership and cultural change that has been pretty clear that it's needed for some time. Um, I can tell you as someone who sits on the committees of oversight in the Senate, who's had a hearing with the acting director of the Secret Service since the director finally resigned, as he should have on day one, um, there's still a lot more questions than there are answers. Um, and the American people deserve those answers. And of course, President Trump and his family and his campaign team deserve those answers as well, because we came within a fraction of an inch of a terrible tragedy, not just for your family, but for our country, whatever your political beliefs are. Any candidate for president should be able to go out, campaign outdoors around large crowds and be protected by our Secret Service. That's what those agents on the ground were doing. That's what they deserve leaders to create the right kind of culture and conditions to allow them to do. Well, I, I agree. Uh, Senator, what are, what are the top priorities for you right now in the United States Senate? Where can the GOP to go to you know, stop the madness uh, and, and really... I guess, retake control there. Right now it's so, you know, it's essentially a tie. Basically, you can't do anything. Uh, what are your thoughts there? What do we need to do there? And how do we get, just get back some of that control? Well, I, I got to tell you, the Senate's probably not going to be doing much more business for the election. Chuck Schumer doesn't have us in session for more than about three weeks because he has so many vulnerable Democrats up for re-election. So, so my focus over the next few months is, is really on the campaign trail for some of these great candidates. Uh, not so much uh, on the legislative calendar, which again is very limited. Um, I, I've worked with candidates over the years. I, I've kind of guess become the go-to person in the Senate for young veterans with families. You know, I got to know J.D. Vance very well during the campaign. He was a great candidate then. I think he's proven to be a great candidate since your dad picked him to be the vice presidential nominee last month. Uh, I got to know Tim Sheehy and Sam Brown. Uh, Tim is running in Montana against John Tester, Sam in Nevada against Jackie Rosen, both outstanding candidates, highly decorated, Purple Heart recipients um, who I think are going to win those Senate seats. So if your audience wants to get off uh, in, in addition to the presidential campaign, look at some of these Senate candidates we have around the country, like Tim in Montana or um, Sam Brown in Nevada, Bernie Marino in Ohio, Carrie Lake in Arizona, Dave McCormick in Pennsylvania, Eric Hubde in Wisconsin. It is vital that we not just elect President Trump again, but yeah. that we give him a sizable Republican majority that can confirm his nominees and pass his agenda through the U.S. Congress for the American people. Um, again, the presidential race obviously is the biggest race of all, but President Trump really does need a workable governing majority in both the House and the Senate, and he knows that as well. That's why you saw him, for instance, last month or last week in Bozeman with Tim Sheehy. Um, it's really important that we win the Senate races um, having worked with a lot of these candidates, giving them advice uh, behind the scenes, you know, on phone calls and text messages about how to deal with all the lying, dishonest, democratic attacks. I'm looking forward now that the kids are almost back in school to getting out yeah. on the campaign trail with them and being in places like Ohio with Bernie Marino and Montana with Tim Sheehy. Yeah, no, I think that's so critical. One thing I tell everyone is like, we, you know, we got to worry all the way down to dog catcher. We got to get everyone there, take back our school boards. I, I, you know, there's a part of me having... Having been through this, and I think you saw some of this, you know, with my 50 hours of congressional testimony, you know, I don't want to win the presidency if you lose the House and you lose the Senate and you have four years of just, you know, 
you know, the, whatever the next Russia, Russia, Russia will be, they'll probably just bring that back up and pretend like it's real again. Uh, so, yeah, we have we have to win these things across the board. I think that's really critical that people, you know, get vested, you know, across the board in all of these races. It's not just about the presidency. It's all the way down the ticket. Yeah, and you're right, all the way down the ticket. I mean, look what your dad has had to face because of elected DAs in New York City and Atlanta. Yeah. Uh, and there are other Republicans who are being persecuted by elected DAs, oftentimes funded by the George Soros machine. Uh, they tried that in Little Rock as well. Fortunately, we were able to beat them back. But uh, I encourage you all to take very careful looks uh, all the way down the ballot, as you say, all the way to dog catcher. I'm, sh I'm sure the way they could uh, <laughs> they could elect Soros dog catchers and find a way to distinguish between Republican and Democratic dog owners. Yeah, uh, by the way, they will. They will weaponize it. They will fund it greatly, and uh, it'll be incredibly damaging to society. But, uh, Senator, I guess a question I always ask, you know, if it's it's 12.01 p.m. Eastern on Inauguration Day in January, what would your minute number one priorities be? I think you have to focus on that day, the things that President Trump can do on day one. Obviously, for instance, there's going to be a major uh, tax uh, bill that's going to pass next year because a lot of the provisions of President Trump's very successful 2017 tax bill will expire next year. But that'll take some number of weeks or even mm -hmm. months. But on day one, President Trump can implement a lot of the policies that Joe Biden reversed on his day one that have endangered the country so badly. Just consider what's happening at our border. He can, for instance, reverse President Biden's asylum policies, re-implement the Remain in Mexico policy. He can, in the meantime, before the uh, inauguration, make it clear to foreign leaders that we expect them to take back their illegals that are their nationals. Otherwise, there are going to be severe consequences to pay. So there are a lot of things that President Trump can literally do on day one when he walks off the podium and into the Capitol to sign a lot of the documents necessary to formalize his inauguration and his nominees to the Senate that will begin to make a difference on day one for the American people. Well, Senator Cotton, thank you so much. Appreciate all your help. I'm sure I will run into you uh, on the campaign trail. Uh, really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Great to be on with you. Look forward to seeing you on the trail. Likewise. Likewise. Guys, uh